uh, to welcome Professor Prabhul Das Gupta. He is Professor and Head of Linguistic Research Unit at the Indian Statistical Institute, Calcutta. He's also President of the World Esperanto Association. His most recent book is called Inhabiting Human Languages. Two of his earlier books include After Etymology and The Otherness of English. The on the, the anti language syndrome in the subtitle, yes. Uh, his talk today is titled um, Placing the Garden Variety Under the Lens. Um, over to Prabhu. Thanks. Thanks, Chandan. Thanks, everybody at APU for having me here. It's a pleasure to speak to such a diverse audience. Uh, it's a particularly special pleasure because I have interests that range over a variety of things and most specific and narrow audiences keep saying that I'm prone to digressions and that this bothers them. In this place, I can be sure that if I digress from one topic, I'm speaking to a different part of the audience anyway. So there can't be any digressions when I'm speaking here. So that, that's why I'm particularly happy to be with an audience like this. That, that is the, uh, why do I call the talk Placing the Garden Variety Under the Lens? Uh, I'm a Bengali. Bengalis try to keep proving that they're clever, and one way they do it is to choose clever titles, right? So Placing the Garden Variety Under the Lens is supposed to sound clever. I don't know if it is clever or not, but the idea was to make it sound clever. Now, when you're trying to be clever, what are you doing? Here, you take a concept like default. If there is a default, shape for something. Uh, geometric shapes, you tend to think of a triangle or a circle when you think of geometric shapes. These are kind of defaults. These are the shapes that immediately come to mind. They're prototypes. When you think of a typical bird, you tend to think of a sparrow, not of a penguin. Sparrow is kind of close to the bird default. Another way to say default that people often use is the word garden variety. A garden variety bird, a garden variety geometric shape, and so on. So when I say the garden variety under the lens, partly I'm outlining an agenda of creating a democratic politics and therefore, for a place like this, creating curriculum material, creating development strategies and so on to work towards such a democratic society, a society which respects difference. By difference, of course, I mean not just inequality, in fact, not inequality at all. By difference, I mean the fact that sections of society have different needs that are so different that one axis is not enough to represent them. Like it's not just a matter of people are divided into male and female, created he, them. It's not a matter of old and young. It's not even a matter of just adding up all the dimensions that a quick sociological matrix would add up. Difference is the fact that people have specific needs and these needs require recognition. This is very quick and this is not very useful, but what I'm trying to say is if you recognize this, you want to work very hard to prevent discrimination. We normally think of discrimination as something that the state does. We want to have non-discriminatory laws, non-discriminatory institutions, basically setting up the state. We also, however, want citizens who are capable of not being discriminatory because if all the citizens of a given area uh, exhibit a certain kind of chauvinism, suppose they're all male chauvinist, or suppose they're communal, and so on, uh, their election behavior will throw up governments that reflect their views, then the state will be discriminatory. So you can't really work towards a just and neutral state without trying to make the citizens just and neutral in their own hearts and minds, because otherwise you have a contradiction in terms. So the question is, how do individual humans stop discriminating? What, what is involved? How can we work towards such a goal? I'd like to propose that the main battle is against taking your defaults too seriously. If you allow your defaults to become normal ways of thinking, if you allow yourself to say, I am entitled 
because of mental laziness to use my defaults all the time and to expect other people to respect the fact that I'm going to use my defaults. You are going to discriminate. For example, you are going to use he in English as a default pronoun, saying he includes women because he is a default. Mind you, about he, many of us forget that there is an issue here, simply the fact that a lot of people have settled for she or have been using she should not blind us to the fact that hardly Robin Lakoff writing her seminal text Language and Woman's Place. Lakoff argues for continued use of he as a default pronoun. Robin Lakoff was violently against tinkering with the pronoun system. If a person like Robin Lakoff could have such a view, we need to think about it. Now, I will, of course, in this matter, side with the present against Robin Lakoff. In fact, Robin must have changed her views. I don't know. You can ask her. She, she's on email. She, I'm sure she answers. The garden variety, rather than default, is I have chosen, however, not simply to be clever. But in order to say that there is something at stake in all the social sciences, in all the presuppositions of our activities as educators and as development workers or development scholars, the point I wish to make is about the garden, the jungle, and the agricultural unit, if you wish, the arable land where you grow crops, whatever particular kind of unit you're thinking of. What I mean by this is the following. Linguistics, although it proposes to study ordinary speaking by human beings in settings where they don't necessarily follow a rule book, even though linguistics, therefore unlike traditional grammar, does not propose to set out to prescribe the rules for correct writing. Nonetheless, when people actually do their linguistics, they follow the model of grammar. What they say is that the system of writing and the system of conventional pedagogy for writing has always followed a certain format and we know how to operate that format that says here boys and girls is an alphabet the letters are A, B, C, D, E here are the spellings of the basic English words here is how the grammar organizes the subject and predicate and so on and so on so since there is already a machinery in place let us not waste energy pointlessly. let us broaden the format so that it includes speech and not only writing, and so that it includes languages that have never been written, and not only languages which have been written. This has been the practice of linguistics. It has been an extension of the grammar to cover what traditional grammars did not cover. Uh, in the metaphor I'm going to use today, you take the logic of the garden, which is an organized space where you control the growth of the plants and whatever else you put in your garden. Imagine a rock garden. Imagine a very carefully designed landscape where you've done everything necessary and it's not just a matter of plants, but various other things that you put into your garden. A, a serious garden often includes water in some shape or size, right? So the logic of the garden with all this diversity of gardens when it is extended, may lead you to say, hmm, a jungle. Why don't I think of this jungle as a deliberately unkempt garden? I hereby declare that I want all this to look exactly the way it looks. Presto, it's my garden. This is how I run my garden. That, that's one way to do it, of course. You, you can be, you, know, uh, you, you can use this, this, this technique for it magically converting the disorganized into a special kind of organization. Now, if it was just linguistics, there'd be very little to say. I'm proposing that this is happening across the board. 
people who run a state naturally have to have laws, possibly a constitution, various other rule books, various relationships between the rule books and the procedures of the state. You need to do that anyway. It's part of your management of the state. If you push that a bit and write a few extra books, slightly expanding this, be writing lessons in the art of producing these objects or relating practices of managing the state, presto, you've got a field called political science, which is the rule books of the state writ large. Likewise, if you take the bookkeeping slash accountancy that you have to do any way to run a capitalist business, or for that matter, even a pre-capitalist business, uh, push it slightly beyond its normal logic, and presto, you have your basic economics. What I'm suggesting is that in discipline after discipline, the tendency to take a very well-organized, well-lighted, clearly understood area where we, as functioning humans, run some kind of system. And we have been running that system for thousands of years in various forms. You take the logic and push it to cover more facts expanding a few things, tweaking a few things. And you say, OK, now I have a discipline that covers all facts of this kind, not just the ones that are subject to this kind of careful, rigorous, systematic human management and organization, but also other more natural looking facts of the same general category. I can handle them by the same kind of logic. This is what I mean by garden. What I'm proposing is that there is a systematic practice of extending the logic of the garden to cover wider areas. That raises the question of whether team is as some kind of a default. Are we saying what we do in our various rigorous gardening practices is, if you wish, the shape of the facts? In other words, are we claiming that bookkeeping slash accountancy, that the management of the state, that grammar writing, all these things were our intuitive initial understanding of what is now social science? Is social science merely that old art of statecraft, etc., continued more extensively and by other means? If that is so, we need look very carefully at the claim that there are such things as social sciences. Why? Because in the natural sciences, we don't even pretend that nature and the human will are very similar to each other. Right? We are trying to discover facts whose organization we have no prior idea about. We go about this enterprise in various hit and miss methods in the early millennia and gradually it gets better and better and then you have the beginnings of the natural sciences. So if you wish the natural sciences are similar to the social science garden. Given that this we need to ask ourselves how those who have practical at a level at which we say we are applying the social sciences, are uh, going to look at the practices in, in these domains that will be most effective. And here we are constrained by what we see as a, a difficulty of time scale, especially at a place like this where there are people coming from a more academic background people who were scholars, basically, and people who have had a more hands-on or activist background. Uh, there is a question of issues of urgency. I tend to say, these things can't wait. You can keep refining your theories forever. You cannot tell us to wait until your theories are ready for us to apply them because the people who need these applications are dying now, slash suffering now, etc. 
that there's a list of reasons why these things are urgent and cannot wait for academics to make their minds about what they wish to do. It is into this context that I want to bring a book that I have learnt a lot from, which addresses some of these issues, a book that I refer to in the short write-up that some of you may have seen when you decided to come to the talk, by David Bleich, called The Double Perspective, Language, Literacy, and Social Relations. In this book, David Black part reports what he learned as a college teacher of literature for more than 10 years. He gradually evolved a very unusual kind of practice of literature teaching. Assume that you're teaching some novels, let's say four novels. So on day one, the teacher announces all 20 students. We're going to read these four novels, and I'll give you, oh, I don't know, three weeks, five weeks to first read them, and then another couple of weeks to write your first term papers. I'll write a term paper too, not just you. So there are 21 term papers at the end of, let's say, two months. Standard American four-month semester, okay? So then, after everybody's written their first term paper, the term papers are Xeroxed and given to everybody else. Each person receives 21 term papers to read, including their own. Everybody then, including the teacher, has to write a second term paper about those 21 term papers. So first you look at the novels. Then you look at everybody was looking at the novels. You criticize the criticism. Why? His purpose was to discover how, in present-day American society, blacks and non-blacks read differently, how men and women read differently, how straight people and gay people read differently, etc. Hence the double perspective, the title of the book. In other words, get a perspective on the perspectives. Out of this came many discoveries. I'll talk about we can't deal all, with all the things at the same time. His finding about boys and girls and the different reading strategies, fiction reading strategies of men and women. The basic finding was a boy tends to compete with the novelist and say, I could have written it better. So boys on the whole, years afterwards when they're trying to remember about a novel, tend to remember the author's name and to forget the names of the characters. Girls tend to remember the names of the characters and forget the names of the authors. These are tendencies, they're not universal facts, but because girls tend to identify with the characters and to enter the world of the novel. Boys tend to have a fight with the author. Competition. So this is one very gross, very general finding. Now, what does Blythe's work imply for unsettling defaults? social justice, changing what we wish to do about strategies, about teaching materials. What implication does this have for us? In particular, I chose to focus on gender. Let's simply stick to gender to have one topic to base all this on. So gender, what is to say about language trying to get a neutral pronoun situation and not allow he in English to be a default pronoun. That, that's only one question about language and gender. What other questions are there and how do we deal with them? I was at a conference in 1980 in Sweden where some of us in this language I use, Esperanto, were trying to look at discrimination. It was a congress on discrimination, so we fanned out into these people doing economics some doing political discrimination, some doing gender discrimination. I was in the gender group. Uh, this should resonate here, Azim Premji has these groups. You have teams, initiatives, and so on. So we, we had that kind of structure. The gender group, I did my homework, I did writing, and uh, in that period, people had been doing very intensive research in Europe and North America about 
gender differences concerning language. One of their findings raised a lot of eyebrows and was hotly discussed in the popular press at the time. The discussion has died down. Every research team that ever gone around with tape recorders or other equipment observing carefully actual speaking by men and women has uniformly found in empirical study after empirical study and country after country that contrary to popular stereotypes which are equally universal, men speak incomparably more than women. There's absolutely no comparison. Several orders of magnitude more than women. Given this, the question is not who speaks more. The question is, why does everybody think that women speak more? That is the research question. And that question has been pending since this discovery in the late 70s. Anybody who doesn't believe this is welcome to get ICSSR funding and launch another project to replicate the result. <laughs> You'll get the same result. If you do enough hours with enough people, you get the same result. Nothing is going to change. That's one example. That, that, that's the, not the most interesting example, but that's one example. Robin Lakoff, in her book, Language and Woman's Place, develops a whole battery of questions concerning the relationship of the gender to language. Her book predates standard academic awareness about the axis between straight and gay people. But I think that there was a line where she records the fact that gay men tend to, like women, have a greater knowledge of colored terms. Isn't that there, Nimala? Doesn't she talk about gay men briefly? I don't remember if she does, but anyway. So anyway, her book predates the, the widespread academic interest in gay people. So obviously, the argument would get much more complicated today if one was looking at that. Uh, Robin Lakoff shows that, well, George, uh, Roger Eakins and Jean Eakins show even more decisively went with a far greater set of empirical studies to back up their, their claims. Men tend to speak in a position-taking tone, which invites the others to simply accept what they're saying and which is prepared, a tone that, that shows that the man is prepared to defend his position against anybody challenging him. Uh, women tend to speak in a way that leaves it open whether or how the people talking to each other shall agree or disagree and prepared to make concessions so that the conversation can evolve towards a consensus, towards agreement, towards doing things together. I'm being very general. There are specific linguistic techniques involved, tag questions, a whole range of qualifiers that, that Robin Lakoff studies in some detail. And this has been studied both in that period, both in English and in Japanese. Japanese was one area where a lot of research had been done, and Robin knew about it so that there's interaction with Japan at the time. Japan raises important questions because Japanese encodes politeness on a very large scale. There was a famous American physicist who thought that serious teaching of physics involved learning languages. So we, when he went to Brazil, he wanted to teach physics. He learned Portuguese to be able to teach physics in college in Portuguese. And then Feynman decided he needed to push this further. He went to Japan and tried to learn Japanese to deal with physics in Japanese. He quickly found that it was beyond even Feynman's genius to learn Japanese in any finite time. So when he gave up in disgust, Feynman wrote, Japanese is not a language, it's a politeness system. <laughs> he gave up. No, he has a, a point. I mean, he found that he was asking colleagues, how do you say? you wrote this paper together. It turned out the answer changes depending on whether a senior and a junior person wrote it together or two senior people wrote it together or a junior and a senior, or two junior people wrote it together. 
how do you say I told this person this? That depends again on where you are in the hierarchy, where the other person that you're talking to is. So we found every single ordinary statement in English would come out in Japanese in three or four different ways, depending on where you are in the hierarchy and which way your speech act is pointing. He gave up. <laughs> I can't deal with this. Uh, I was getting a Japanese periodical, which is in the Esperanto language. I was getting it regularly for free. And at one stage, the publisher wrote a note saying, those of you getting it for free, we realize you can't really afford to pay for this, but uh, can you please sometimes send some written contributions? That would be nice, send something. I wrote a letter. The periodic is called Novajoy Tam Tamas, the drumbeat of news. I said, well, we in the Esperanto world are in the business of trying to learn how to be gentle with each other across cultural barriers, how to accommodate each other's different perceptions. And that is basically a project of politeness. Uh, Japan surely kind of holds the world record, world record in politeness. It's one of the most polite societies known. Uh, maybe you guys can give us some tips. I wrote it in a lighter vein. Little did I know that you don't send letters to Japan in a lighter vein. You can't imagine what happened. They started to Japanese efficiency campaign. The letter was distributed to a whole range of Esperantists all over the length of Japan. They don't have much breadth, so it is the length of Japan. And responses kept pouring in. They were serialized over three or four issues of Novashi Tam Tamas. Are we in Japan polite, as Mr. Dasgupta implies? How did he get such a bizarre impression? In the samurai period, when the Lord, the samurai Lord was in front of us, we used to bow like this because otherwise he'd chop our head off. And we knew this. So we have learned how to bow out of fear, not politeness. Mr. Dasgupta can't tell the difference between fear and politeness. <laughs> he had a wet All the foreigners in Japan were asked, do you find us polite? No, we don't find you polite. <laughs> Bearer responses. The Japanese are agreed. They're not polite at all. And I was an idiot to suggest that Japan is a polite nation. So then this happened. This reminds me of a joke about a, an interreligious conference. There's a Japanese delegate who's gone there. I'll hold you while I take this call. This must be important. Hello? Hello. Yes? I, I don't think this is a good time to call Jyoti. Try me three hours later. I see, I see a bank. <laughs> There's this interreligious conference, and a Japanese delegate there goes up to his neighbor who he's met for the first time. He says, my miserable superstition is Shintoism. What is yours? <laughs> if you analyze the politeness structure of this, it's wonderful. Because up to the moment before he says, what is yours? He's being polite. But suddenly he's asking, what is your miserable superstition? <laughs> He didn't mean this. <laughs> so there, there are these beautiful things about politeness. Now, in politeness, what are you trying to do vis-a-vis -vis social justice? Robin Lakoff has shown, by performing pragmatic analysis of polite speech acts, that the fundamental gesture of polite speaking is to minimize the liberty of the speaker and maximize the liberty of the person spoken to. Pass the salt. I'm giving you no leeway. If you don't pass the salt, you're disobeying what I said. Please pass the salt. Some leeway. Could you please pass the salt? More leeway. 
So the politer you get, you're giving more elbow room to the other person to pretend that they hadn't heard you without offending you and so on. That, that's the basic uh, content of politeness. For politeness, you want to show that you're at a certain distance from your interlocutor. If you come too close to your interlocutor, physically or verbally, you're not giving enough leeway. If uh, an impersonal state or individuals who are aspiring to those democratic habits which will create an impersonal state, say to persons who've been oppressed for a long time, such as Dalits, such as women, I wish to be polite to you. So I will operate at a huge distance from you to give you tons of freedom. And I will operate from this distance by paying zero attention to you as an individual. Because that would be targeting. I don't want to target you. Such a structure, while appearing to maximize politeness to everybody by being equally and rigorously inattentive to what is personally distinctive about everybody, in fact, does not serve the cause of social justice because it's operating with the default of a citizen who wishes to be left alone, who doesn't want the attention of the state, who would resent such attention, who doesn't want your attention, who would resent your attention. But if somebody has until recently been a victim or even feels like a victim partly now, they want a certain kind of attention which says, I notice and respect the fact that you have been and to some extent still are a victim and therefore I am attentive to this fact about you. How can you at the same time be attentive to the fact that somebody has been a victim or is a victim and not appear to be taking ghoulish pleasure in the fact that they have been a victim or are still in a victim position. For example, under current laws, it is a crime to call a Dalit by any of the derogatory designations. I believe this includes the word Harijan. I don't think it includes the word Dalit. A Dalit? Do you know the position? Yes, Dalit is okay, yeah. Dalit is okay. Harijan is not and names of castes are not. Right? Notice that what is being said here is that you should keep a distance from the fact that somebody is, let us say, a Mahar or whatever the caste is that is involved. If you're required to keep a distance, and if you are, I don't know, a sovereign Hindu who has chauvinistic tendencies, your tendency will be to solve the problem by, if possible, avoiding contact, social and cognitive contact with Dalit, so that the problem does not arise, and keeping a distance. Now, keeping a distance, however, is not what is being requested. What is being requested is respectful attention. That is hard. So what I'm really trying to say is that if you wish to unsettle the defaults where our prejudices seem to be located, on the one hand, you have to pay specific attention to each person's separateness. You need to notice that a blind person is blind, that a deaf person is deaf, and so on. The childhood primer many of us were brought upon by Ishwar Chandra Vidyasagar in Bangla, in the version for, I think, the second class, says, it is wrong to call a lame person lame, a blind person blind, a deaf person deaf. 
What Vidya Sagar is here stating is that if somebody has a problem, it is your duty not to pay attention to the fact that that person has a problem. If you pay explicit and overt attention, you are shaming that person, you're humiliating that person. You have here a puzzle. The ethic towards which we mo wish to move requires you to pay specific targeted attention to individual problems. At the same time, you must not be ghoulish or voyeuristic in the way that you are doing this. Notice how hard it is to even write this down as a law, let alone how hard it is to impart this value to everybody. I'm simply asking you to think for a while how hard the task is that we are setting ourselves. We have a tough time enforcing the Constitution of India as it stands. The Constitution is fairly wooden. It had to be wooden because hundreds of people had to put it together. So of course it reflects a kind of common denominator. And common denominators are wooden. They cannot be nuanced and delicate and works of art. You can't expect it. At the same time here, you're, you're requesting this. You're requesting that your behavior should be a work of art. Let me take you to a situation where somebody who had spent his life thinking about these issues had come up with a principle in his mature years. Uh, I was trying to understand the principle. His name is Kanti Shah. Kanti Shah was at Dharwar University for a while. Some of you may have heard of him. Kanti's daughter Anuradha Viravalli teaches philosophy at Delhi University. Kanti was a student of Wittgenstein's. I used to call him Kanti Bhai. He passed away in 1994. Kanti Shah enunciated in the early 1980s in Pune. He was then based in Pune. A principle that goes as follows. I'm having an argument, let's say, with him, I'm sure. And while having this argument with him, it occurs to me that if, if I utter one sentence, if I point out something to him, the point will be so devastating for him, Himangshu's position that he will at once accept everything I'm saying. Kanti Bhai says, if you think of such a point. It is your duty not to make the point. Do not use it. If you have a knockdown argument, it is your duty not to use it. I heard this through a friend, Michael. So next time I saw Kanti Bhai, we were having lunch at the guest house of Pune University, where the nice thing about the setting was that Pune University back then didn't have enough chairs. So one had to stand and eat like this. You will soon see why this is important. I said, Kantipa, can you explain to me the point that uh, you communicated to Michael? Uh, is it this? You are a practicing Jaina. You believe in Ahinsa. And killing somebody else's theory is like killing a cockroach. You're saying, don't kill the cockroach. Kantipa said, no, 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 you didn't get my point. Kill your cockroach. Don't rub it in. His point was, if you have thought of an argument, that is a knockdown argument. If you use that argument against Himangshu's position, Himangshu's position will collapse. He won't recover. It is your duty not to use it because by trying to use such an argument, by trying to make Himangshu's position collapse beyond the point of recovery, you're expressing the thought that you alone should be on stage. There should be nobody else. You don't want a debate. You want to be alone. You are violating the stage itself as a principle. The dancer in classical India has to begin by paying obeisance to the stage. 
Kanti Pai was saying at all times a debater must respect the integrity of the stage where at least two people should be able to continue to speak. If you have thought of something that will prevent the other person from speaking at all, that will silence the other person, it is your duty not to use it. I'm not asking you to simply take Kanti Pai's view and adopt it. I'm saying think about the kind of reasoning he's inviting us to do. I have never seen this kind of reasoning, you see, in ordinary discussions of the kinds of enterprise we engage in, which are quite various. I'm deliberately trying to use examples that are probably usable for all of us, that are probably going to speak to all of us, even if not all of us directly engage with these issues. I hope I'm succeeding. I don't know if I am. Another example of this kind comes from the work of another Indian philosopher, Abu Sayyid Ayub, roughly 1906 to 1982. Abu Sayyid Ayub, a major intellectual, not just a philosopher, but a literary critic and theorist, specialized in Tagore studies. Ayub had a view about defending freedom. It was a very interesting view. You have a right to defend the freedom of others. In fact, you have a duty. You have no duty to defend your own freedom. And it is not clear if you have a right to do so either. Why? Why does Ayub see a difference here? The freedom of others is an area where you are required to exercise your freedom as much as you can to make sure that others continue to be free. As for your own freedom, it is coterminous with whether you can act at all. It is sort of nonsensical to exercise your freedom, to maximize your freedom. There is some kind of a contradiction. So when you say you're defending your freedom, you're probably deceiving yourself. This is probably a mask for doing something else that you're calling defending your freedom. And it is your duty to avoid things that probably plunge you into self-deception. This is right, roughly the, the reasoning behind it. He never quite articulated why he felt that defending of the freedom of others is an important thing to do and defending your own freedom cannot be. He had this intuition that there's an asymmetry there. Now, these asymmetries, the, the kind of asymmetry that Ayub talks about and the kind of asymmetry Kanti Bhai talks about, an issue that I discussed with a major Buddhist intellectual who was a personal friend of Jiddu Krishnamurti's. I don't know this Buddhist intellectual's real name, and even if I knew it, I would not know how to pronounce it, because he's Tibetan. Uh, people call him the Rinpoche, or they used to call him the Rinpoche in 2004. Rinpoche being a designation for somebody in the hierarchy of the Tibetans who live in India. At that point, this gentleman was the prime minister of the government in exile of Tibet, right? Himachal Pradesh. So, some of us were meeting him. And I raised the question. I said, uh, I notice an interesting asymmetry. Uh, Buddhism enjoins the practice of compassion. You're supposed to forgive other people as much as you can. Uh, I want to understand how this squares with the fact that, uh, as I see Tibetan art, the mandalas that Tibetans paint, draw, etc., are of exquisite perfection. I get the impression that a practicing Buddhist, whenever he or she practices some art form, is aiming for perfection. If you're aiming for perfection at some level, you're not willing to forgive yourself, right? You're, you're pushing, you're pushing yourself. Why are you supposed to forgive only others and not yourself? Why this perfectionism in your own behavior and this permissiveness about the behavior of others? What's, what's going on? The Rinpoche said, you're calling perfection 
enjoy is if you surely very common status, a lot of it, especially in English. It's common. And that's just ruled by a bit of our times in the common. Why do you see this? It, in a world where everybody is identical, is common. How are other people going to be fair to you? You are asking them to be complicated. If you are complicated, people seem you to be fair to you, have to give you complexity. Yeah, what's the time now? Like? This is about five. I started at four. What are we talking about in terms of expected people question answer of the information? Okay. If you seek injustice from to apply can't go to do to others what you want others to do. You need to understand can't go to do assume a relatively simply definable work. We are by definition today facing a world where individual identities and the hang-ups you're carrying with you and the problems each is worth a novel, and you expect me to read a novel to understand you before I know how to be fair. This is the question. Under these conditions, there are several possibilities. One is to try to find some rules of thumb, some very gross, basic, simple principles, and get a wide consensus about whether to do this now. Lebanon has these communities that have been in conflict for a very long time. I believe they're called Christians, Muslims, and some category called Jews. I don't quite understand who the Jews are here in Turkey. Let's assume there's some category out there that lives in Lebanon. Uh, if I get the picture right, Lebanon manages its multi ethnic state by, I believe that's a character in Calcutta who sent me a a message for which I'm receiving certain copies. It happens from time to time. That message. It's been coming since the morning. I've already deleted uh, 10 copies. Lebanon, if it has a Jews president, must have a Christian prime minister and a Muslim finance. That's a question. And then the three categories of copies. So Lebanon has this rule of thumb that they have exact partition of the powerful seats among the three communities. They have this example, which is similar in principle to Indian residents. That there is this kind of placing of people in particular states. Now, as we look at any day in newspaper, the Indian will reveal our reservation system has now gotten to the point where people are being stampeded into expanding to the point where everything is reserved. And I'm beginning to wonder when people start asking that the Indian railways to abolish unreserved compartments. In a nation where reservation is universal, there should be no unreserved compartments. I feel like fighting a public interest litigation, the Supreme Court say, look, unreserved compartments are unconstitutional. Now that everything is but the point I'm making is we are at the point where reservation has far exceeded the type of scope that uh, Dr. Lambertikar intended when he invented the I don't by this wish to include any particular application of reservation. I'm talking about the situation our republic has now reached. We seem to need a deep, we seem to need some Lebanon type solution where people say, look, in the interest of the flow of traffic, let us adopt the following conditions that we do these things along these relatively stupid looking mechanical lines that everybody agrees will look grossly fair. 
with the gross fairness achieved by these mechanical traffic controls. You can now let individuals do their fine tuning as they wish. Why not? Why does this traffic convention idea come out of it? I'm saying there is a whole bunch of asymmetries. The Kantisha asymmetry, the Ayub asymmetry, and several others. I'm just considering it. If you read any book about justice, like the stuff by Morris Ginsburg, the stuff by Roth, the stuff by what you say, there's a whole bunch of them. You will see that all theoreticians of justice deal with anomalous cases, with asymmetry special conditions under which principles where they apply seem to apply backwards. It's a whole range of things. It seems to me that if you try to put the exceptions in the way rule, you get unworld with the constitution. When I say traffic arrangement, I mean not something that goes into the constitution. I mean a consensus that the people now living in the country come up with and enforce through the normal legislative mechanisms using their advanced subhas and terms. I don't mean changing the constitution, because if you keep doing that, you get into a bind. Our constitution is already very screwy. If you look at where we are, the constitution without the amendments, it's a very contorted geometry. You don't want to go there. The general principle I'm trying to get across in today's talk is that Unsettling defaults is very difficult. We live on defaults. We want to be intellectually easy. We don't want to keep thinking every time. <coughs> but nowadays, everybody is very touchy and sensitive about it. So the moment you open your mouth, you're running the risk of offending somebody. Like today, I think over here in the cafeteria, man, <coughs> already a few hours that has been pending, you still have offended somebody. It's very really easy to do. So the point is, you need some safeguard against this tendency to offend in a world where offending has become dangerous. At the same time, you want individual liberty. It seems to me the only way to achieve this is to build some very gross and to leave the delicate adjustments to persons dealing with it. I wish to end by quoting a principle of one of my favorite mentors. He never became my teacher because he was absent from Deccan College Pune when I studied there. That's my Kupchandani. Kupchandani accuses intellectuals of mixing up two methods of weighing. He says there's the gross kind of scale that is used in the marketplace for measuring the weight of wheat or for weighing rice weighing, you know, big objects of that kind, one kilo, two kilos, five kilos, and then there are these very, very delicate machines which we call balances, used by jewelers where you are measuring very tiny quantities of gold and you have to get it exactly right how many milligrams of gold you are buying to sit. And Bhatman Kuchanani has argued that intellectuals far too often take the jeweler's apparatus and try to use it to weigh the wheat that they want to buy or sell. That they mix up the special delicate care needed for micro examples. And they don't understand that you need gross methods for gross tasks. And that you need to differentiate your tool to have gross tools for some purposes and delicate tools. I'm proposing that we need the delicate work individuals and for this purpose we equip the social structure and our pedagogy with gross measures for which we merely need a kind of head counting consensus to take a measure of what the republic wants at a given time. How to achieve this is a different question. Some countries could go for the referendum. That is what we need. So that's the model I think. Of it's a complicated story because folks, we're all very complicated. That's why we are touching. And we are touching in ways that people are not touching in Japan. In Japan, 
Japan is a highly cordial. So it's relatively easy to get a lot of that. Of course, it means my friend Michiko Kosaka can't get a job there. She tried Japan. She had been in the US for a long time. Then tried to get a job in Japan. The professor took one of her and said, you're a bird. She said, ah, you know, just. She said, I can't give you a job here. You don't have birds. You can give a talk. You're from America. Can't get you a job. And then a neighborhood where she was proposing to settle said, You have a black boyfriend. Are you going to marry him? She said, Yeah, that's okay. Then we can't visit you. We don't visit that. So she wrote me a letter saying, Japan is a spiritual free state. I can't say that. So she had a West Indian fiance who got married in the US when I lost it. Japan is straightforward. It's racist, sexist, various other things. It has a very delicate set of adjustments based on these showings. It's a bit difficult. The Japanese system is deeply essential. But it's clear that it's okay. I'm not talking about Japan. Japan is a conference. I'm talking about the global reality which is emerging, of which India is actually doing. India is a different. The kinds of difficulty we manage in India, the kinds of touchiness that we exemplify in India, are different. We're in that sense, we primary laboratory What we don't solve will not get solved. Levi Strauss pointed out in the 1950s that the world is converging on becoming like South Africa. It has come to pass. He said in the 50s it was not to I rest my case. Lebanon, now you know, you, so it seems to be an attractive, you know, case where you have certain broad rules saying that the Tuesdays are this and that. Can you take this one? See, I think it's the driver. Now, uh, if you look at their their recent history, the one of the main stress points has been why are the minority Christians always the presidents? Why do the Shias not have, you know, share in the parliament? commensurate to their numbers because this share consortium, this you know democratic structure was imposed during the French I period. See. Now, as I said that, you know, I mean a Maronite will always be the president, a Shia will be, so this, this is under huge stress. But that's not my main point. So now coming to India, see we have very general, most of us believe that the Indian Constitution has been um, amended on and on again. Now it is you know, out of sh shape. Mm -hmm. If we try to look at the amendments, a majority of them about that the name of the state has changed or a new state has been created. Its name mm -hmm. has changed. A new language has entered the schedule or some uh, previous you know legal system um, provisions. Life has been extended. So if you take out these things, there is hardly the any. How many are the amendments? If you take those out. So it'll be it'll be almost half of the existing. The total just number is 50. in the 80s, na? It's about 100, 100 something, 100, 100 200, 100. So to just you know, 50, and even oh, so 50. those 50, a number of them are procedural amendments. I mean, okay. fundamental amendments, you know, there are that many. Okay. system very few. Okay. Okay. Now, but uh, so now the third point that is, which is I think more important for me, that Kanti Shah's you know example of you know you stamp the cock but not debit of because you have a respect for the stage, the stage has to be preserved. Uh, because you, you said he's a Jain, could it not be the case that he believed in the the position of palism? That's what I asked, Jain. he said no. He said, he said no. no. I asked him that. Okay. That was my question, that are you doing this as a Jain? He said no, as a philosopher, not as a Jain. So, Palibalism would say that, you know, I am never it's absolutely sure palibalism. that I have the yeah. final mm. conclusive mm. blow. So I say, I guess this is the case, but perhaps I'm wrong. And Syad Wad would tell me that you know that I should leave the room for the uh, uh, I mean, opponent to reclaim space. So, to, so Gandhi's you know this this mm. all inclusive thought, non-violence, etc., etc., comes from the Jain Syad Wad. Uh, That's what I thought. That's yeah. what I asked him. That was my but question. He said no. He said no. He Which said is no. interesting because right. I thought right. you know. We, we, I thought that too. I had the same thought that you did. So that's what I took to him. Yeah. 
Yes. But he said, no, don't rub it in. Right. So what he's saying seems to be, don't be aggressive as an arguer. Don't engage in this in order to win. Try to get it right. There is a difference between trying to win and trying to get it right. He was saying, try, try to get it right. And if you're trying to win, you're probably not trying to get it right. I think that, that, that is basically what he's saying. Recall that Socrates is made to say in one of the Platonic dialogues, I forget which one, right now I'm not a philosopher, a lover of wisdom, right now I'm a fellow victor, somebody who wants to win. Socrates says this in so many words, in one passage. So he's saying don't be a fellow, I mean, Kanti is saying don't be a fellow victor, always be a philosopher. I'm trying to deduce his position to something else, I'm just saying, is it could be that he's making a difference between means and ends, that I shouldn't become a victor, I should try to do things in the proper spirit, and if I emerge to be a victor, then that's all right for me. But you know, I'm not going to be fixated to be the, the to be proven to be the correct person in the end of this thing. So is it again, you know, like a Gandhian position of means and distinction? Uh, it's a means and connection. I need, I, I kept one fact concealed from you. Kanti Shah was not just a Jain, he was a Gandhian. Okay. He was a direct Bhakta of Gandhi and had spent half his life uh, trying to live the Gandhian ideal. It happened for a purely personal reason. He went to his true guru, Wittgenstein, when he was leaving Britain. Wittgenstein was then suffering from cancer and couldn't speak very much. He gave him a tiny bit of time. So Kanti sat there and Wittgenstein was packing his books to go away. And Kanti said, can I help? Wittgenstein said, you can help by saying, staying there and not interfering. So he sat there. And then he said, I'm going back to India. Do you have any advice? And Wittgenstein said, ask Gandhi. Now, Gandhi Bhai did not have the heart to say, uh, Professor Wittgenstein, Gandhi's been dead for three years. He took it to me. <laughs> Wittgenstein had forgotten that Gandhi had died. <laughs> this is 1951. <laughs> He took it to mean the simpler and more satisfying for society to try some mechanical solution. We can, I think, often persuade ourselves that having a mechanical ap approximation of fairness is better than not trying at all. I'm not saying it's perfect, and I'm not saying the Lebanese model is to be emulated, but it's an idea. It, it, it's a kind of but one then, way to do things. This leads to supplementary question, a short supplementary it just means that you know that we cannot dispense with the garden the variety. So we have to start with some with some kind of gross thing, which would be definitely my garden variety, or Lebanese or Japanese or Indian garden variety, mm. and the and the garden varieties cannot be dispensed with them because you know because uh, it's like you know I remember a truncated triangle by saying it's a triangle, but it is. Truncated. I say it's a half a sphere by saying it's a sphere. So, so you cannot dispense with garden varieties much as we may dislike it. Now, you began with the discussion on discrimination, etc., by saying that garden varieties, uh, dis uh, I mean, propagate discrimination, and then we come close, we close the circle, saying that we need garden varieties to be sensitive to differences, and so it's a bit confusing to me. The thing is, we cannot stop maintaining gardens. Our practices can't stop. Yeah. Uh, bookkeeping will continue. Yeah. Constitutions will continue. Laws will continue. Grammars will continue. Yeah. You can't dispense with them. The point is we have allowed them to become a metaphor for everything else. That cannot be the case. Everything is not the garden. So that was a lie. That was the social science lie. You can get out of the lie. You can't get out of gardens, of course not. Yeah. yeah I was only going to say this that I don't think... Okay. Yeah. Use it anyway. Okay. Yeah. Well, anyway, uh, yeah. I was only going to say that yes, I understand that we should seek to get it right. We should not seek to win, yeah. as you tried to explain. But then, uh, if we are seeking to get it right, uh, and we are arguing with somebody, and we are saying that I won't completely destroy your argument, because uh, after all, truth is many-sided, and I can't claim that I have the whole of truth with me, right, on my side. Which is why I do not completely snub anybody else or destroy their argument. 
and then in a sense it does go back to Syadwad because that is what Syadwad said the truth is many sided and therefore since you can never be sure that you've got monopoly over the truth you mustn't be violent with other people so whether Kanti knew that this is a Jain principle at work or not is another matter he knew it yeah he deliberately I mean, mm. he answered my question completely. Mm. So that, that was not mm. what I was saying. But no, I would understand him as saying that if you have a knockdown argument, go home and write it out mm. and write out what you think the other person would have said. Exactly. But do not do it there on the spot to snub him yes. or her. That that is a different question. Which made me think Sorry? Which made me think yeah. it was less to do with epistemology and more than with the staging. Than with psychology. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, right, right, right. But psychology of personal justice to the other in the context of the interaction. Yeah. That nonetheless comes back to epistemology because epistemology is connected to the method that takes you to the truth. And having the right kinds of conversations is part of that method. So it, it's complicated. I mean, you can't simply say it is just psychology. It's psychology in the service of it's philosophy. Psychology. psychology in the service of philosophy. Yeah, yeah. So it's, yes. I haven't worked out what my answer is to Kanti's question. Yes. It's still an I, I, unresolved but, place. But, but what I can, yeah, so. what I can uh, you know, uh, think of is that it's certainly related to the idea that truth yes. is many-sided. Oh, certainly. And you can't yeah, have certainly. monopoly over the truth. I think if he had not been a Jaina, this would not have occurred to him. I think there is that a basis. I, that I don't know. That I can't say. Well, maybe but, not. Yeah, maybe. Maybe it helped. Maybe it helped the team. The other thing that I wanted to yeah. raise was that, you know, you said that politeness in a sense means that you pay zero attention to the person to whom you want to be polite. That was one way one could inflect it. I was considering yes, that. Yes, yes, that was one way in which you yeah. can look yeah. at politeness, yeah. correct? Yeah. 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 But can you not think of a situation and, you know, talk of Japan, you right. offered a lot of examples right. from right. Japan. I've lived right. and worked in Japan for four years. Yeah. 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 And, you know, interestingly, the Japanese waiters, yes. their notion of politeness was that uh, they would pay zero attention to you in a personal sense, hmm. but still pay a lot of attention to your needs. I see. You know? And I thought that uh, they are probably the best trained waiters in the whole world. Uh, not that I've seen the whole world, but still. Uh, so, so I was wondering whether we could sort of think of politeness in that sense. That, uh, but of course, there are asymmetries there which you addressed, uh, which we'd need to engage with. But you, you pay zero attention to, to the somebody person. personally, the person. yes. to the personal aspects of the self, but at the same time, pay a lot of attention to their Needs. Basic needs. Okay. Okay. Hmm. Yeah. Yes. Any question? Thank you so much. See, um, one of your statement was that to unsettle the default, you need to give specific attention to the victim. So my question would be then: um, then how would you approach this problem from the on the side of victim. Here comes, here comes the issue of forgiveness, which you spoke about a little bit. Could you please more elaborate on this? I have in mind particularly uh, a, um, a, a lecture by Yak Darida in uh, Johannesburg yes. talking about forgiveness. Yes. Yes. And my question would be, stick with this, you know, how far is, how far is it possible to ask forgiveness for an offended victim. It, this problem is complicated when the offense is going on. Yes, yes. Uh, Derita, for some of us who haven't read the text, is asking in the context of gross crimes like apartheid, like the Nazi Holocaust, how forgiveness is possible at all. It's something so monstrous or disproportionately criminal. Derrida has a very interesting thought there. He says, when something has been done, when some wrongdoing has happened, that is sort of of minor size, to deal with the wrongdoing, uh, people usually have a sense of justice, of punishment, of compensation, of setting the balance right, of restitution, and settling the matter. 
And Derrida says with something like apartheid or something like uh, untouchability in India, he doesn't say that, but it's part of the same scale of magnitude for the Nazi Holocaust. Because the scale is so stupendous and justice is not possible, the question of forgiveness arises. And Derrida then says something paradoxical. He says, if you cannot forgive the unforgivable, what is forgiveness for? For the other cases, you have justice. You don't need forgiveness. Surely you need forgiveness only for that which is so incredibly criminal that it is unforgivable. By forgiving it, in fact, you're recognizing that it is unforgivable. That is the point he makes. It's a very strange and troubling text. And you need to understand he gave this lecture in South Africa. I mean, just imagine what kind of cuts it takes to go to South Africa and lecture about forgiveness. At the moment when all this is being discussed, the early 90s, I forget the date when he does this. I didn't know that Derrida had done this when I did something very similarly gross. I went to Sri Lanka in 2000 and lectured about peace. I was saying to myself, what am I doing lecturing to Sri Lankans about peace? And they told me a few quiet things back, and I learned a lot about peace in Sri Lanka that, that year. But anyway, to, to come back to this uh, about forgiveness and uh, the proportion over which forgiveness becomes understandable or stops being understandable. My understanding as somebody who's been troubled by having difficulty forgiving. I'm, I'm not an easy forgiver. I, I resent for a very long time. I bear grudges that they stay and they stay and they say. Uh, my sense of why I want to become stronger and I want to be able to forgive is mainly that if somebody has been so gross or is so gross that they cannot do something right, that what they do wounds me and wounds others, that they hurt people. They're clearly incapable of repairing the situation that needs to be repaired. So the only person here who can repair it is me. Because the other chap clearly can't. Otherwise they wouldn't have done it or they would have repaired it. They're incapable of repairing it. So what am I doing sitting here waiting for repair by somebody of whom I know that they're incapable of doing it? Why don't I do the repair myself? I need the repair, right? The other person doesn't need it. As far as I can see, the other person is gross and it doesn't affect the person for some reason. Instead of my worrying about that person's psychology and what will be of benefit to that person's progress, surely my task is to repair at my end because I need it. That is how I look at it when I try to persuade myself to become a more forgiving person. But the bad news is I don't succeed. <laughs> I'm still a very resentful and grudge-bearing person. Who listens to all these lectures and nothing happens? <laughs> I'm still where I was. I'd like to be better. I'm talking about the ways in which I would like to be better. I, I haven't gotten there. Don't get me wrong. I'm not talking about what I've been able to do. I'm talking about what I'd like to do. <laughs> which is very different. I'm sorry that I think it's funny. But it's because I can't change. <laughs> I find it funny that I can't change. That I want so to change. You feel just as a subject. Sorry? I mean cannot ultimately forgive despite the logic that you... Right, that's what I'm saying. The logic doesn't... Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah doesn't. So because you feel justice is suffered? I have no idea. I just think I'm not strong enough. A, a forgiving person has to be strong. I don't think I'm a strong enough person. If I can become stronger, I'll be more forgiving, I think. This is Nietzsche. Nietzsche on forgiveness is all about this. Yeah. That if you're strong, you can forgive. Maybe, maybe, head and heart. Between the head and the heart. Where is it? And uh, in the head you may understand and rationalize yeah. and you know, sure. tell sure. yourself this and that. Yes. Yes. But forgiveness has to come from the heart. Yes. Where is it? This macro and micro, uh, I mean, that is, 
taking for gold, weighing gold versus weighing this, that question. Uh, I've been thinking, you know, like uh, if if I try to uh, address uh, an all-pervasive kind of a um, presence, which is unfair to women, using very minor, small uh, thing, it doesn't even work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. I think each has to be handled very differently. I agree with that uh, insight. Uh, just yesterday I was uh, in class cracking a joke about, uh, you know, like how Chomsky uses LAD as the, the language acquisition device, whereas I prefer Brunner, I said, who uses LASS. Language mm -hmm. acquisition LAS, LAS, support yes. system. Yes, so yes, yes. I prefer Bruner because uh, he uses LAS mm -hmm. and not LAD. Mm -hmm. And I get the comment that no feminist jokes, please. I see. See, something as, you know, like all the time, you know, women yeah, yeah. are uh, the butt of all kinds of jokes and all uh -huh. kinds of stereotypes. Yeah. And one, you know, what I would have thought a very uh, harmless, you know, and it is not a directed uh, kind mm. of a joke at anybody mm. or, mm. and it's not even disrespectful of yes. anything. Yes. Mm. Uh, it's so hard for, uh, you know, mm. this to take. So sometimes I wonder, you know, like in doing this micro little things about he, uh, she and, uh, you know, etc. I agree that that doesn't uh, seem to be effective at all. It's not good enough. Yeah, Robin Likos thought it would be a waste of time. Yeah. So... She thought you were tilting at windmills if you did that. But at least, she, she, yeah, it... Uh, it and yet I sympathize with people who did it. No, but uh, though it may not address the larger questions, right. at least, you know, you begin somewhere because begin your somewhere, space yeah. is only this much in the whole right. scheme of right. things. Right. Right. So right. you can only begin from where you are and that's a little mm -hmm. space in this large structural yes. Yes. thing. Therefore, slowly maybe, you know, uh, if so many such small little moments uh, mm -hmm. come together, only then it can become macro because there's no will to change the macro. Right, right. Yeah. So it, if the macro has to change, it has to be through small steps and small waves that then it can, should become a tsunami and only then change can happen. Maurice Ginsberg argues that in some places, I don't need to have this, this attached to me, that in some uh, situations, if the law changes first, it has the educational function of helping individuals to change in a certain direction. When Romila Thapar was our chancellor, by, or I mean University of Hyderabad chancellor, she gave a talk where she said, when we say India is a secular country, we mean India is a country that wants to be secular. It's a resolution. <laughs> it's a desire. <laughs> Not that we are there, we are nowhere near there and it isn't even clear how we are going to get there. But to say we are a secular country means we want to be secular. I thought that was a very important statement to say that we are a secular country is a desire. We want to be secular. That's true of nearly all the other things we are trying to do. So it's, we keep starting all over again. It's beginnings and beginnings and beginnings. And Maybe there is a certain need to accept this because there's always children born and growing up and those of us who've been trying to do something get tired and either stop or die. And so that, that new generations have to take something up means that everything must have the character of a beginning because people have to join it and they're beginning. So if things don't have the character of the beginning, how will beginners join it? So that way the fact that things look like beginnings is fine. That, that, that's how it needs to be so that people can take part. I suppose and that, that, that's when we look at it. You become a citizen. Citizens aren't born. Citizens are always made. Yeah. But, but you know, the other logic for this yes. is yeah. that everything is a relationship ultimately. Yes, yes. Whether it's a nation or a marriage or a friendship or whatever. Yeah, sure. And hmm. relationships need to be constructed in you all the time. Right. Otherwise, right. they're all yes. flat, yes. right? Yes. So therefore, you must have beginnings all the time. Right, right, right. Rahul, I had a quick question. Uh, on this, someone else doesn't have one. Uh, you know, this, uh, I wasn't clear when you ended by talking about two ways of weighing. Way, yes. And the rough way of weighing as being necessary for identifying our own jungle and thereby cultivating our own garden it, to reduce the conceptual dependence of the social sciences on the 
seems it's to me that the is, rest is the is playing. Yeah. Or, yeah. You stake out an area in the jungle by putting up a huge post and tying a kind of flag to it. Saying, this is the area of jungle we're trying to clear first. As a coach. The kind of pointers. It isn't garden yet, it isn't anything like even manageable agricultural land yet. But we have ideas here, let's try to do something here. Can we go this way, please? Something this like, yeah. This sense of wanting to be able to be autonomous in identifying our jungle and yeah. cultivating a garden is an at least you know, many, many decades old desire on the part of modern Indian intellectuals. Gandhi being a spectacular mm. example of someone who wanted to have his own garden based on the jungle that he saw. And this is gross in the sense of civilizational scale, right? Uh, involving some impoliteness to some you know, in the manner of putting together the conceptual cluster. Um, but is this what you think is necessary at this point, not these fine-tuned reworking of concepts at micro levels? I mean, what were you inviting us to think as a way of, you know, having a big stab at this problem? Well, since I was dealing, I knew with a room full of people with very different kinds and levels of awareness and different points in their trajectory of doing this. I thought that uh, each would take away what he or she wanted and so on. I did not have a general message for the entire audience because I, I think such a thought is invalid. I can have something general about what I wish to do and it usually falls flat because as I said I'm very resistant to change. I keep trying to get myself to change in specific ways and fail. Maybe there are incremental changes that I don't notice. I only notice that when I go to Vietnam, I keep this Ho Chi Minh beard because I've been asked to do it so people respect me. And when I come back to India, I shave. And you know, so these I notice. These are obvious. I can, I can handle that. But the smaller incremental changes I want, I at least don't notice them happening. Maybe they happen. But what I notice is very disappointing. It's resistance to change. When I resist change so much, I don't have the moral courage to ask other people to change. So when you're asking me, what am I asking the audience to do? I don't dare ask the audience to do anything when I'm not able to change. I don't have the moral right to ask others to do what I'm not doing. I can merely report that I'm trying and failing. In the realm that of may or may not be useful. In the realm of conceptual practices, forget anything yeah. grand as self-reform. Okay. Uh, okay. I meant in practices of discipline, these domains that you've seen at close range happen in this? Uh, I would say that one needs to differentiate two kinds of interface between activists and academics. Uh, one kind of interface where the activists have some absolutely immediate things to do that have to be done the next three months, six months, that need timetables, specific things. You need traffic-wise efficient solutions. Academics can sometimes just roll up their sleeves and become designers with the activists for those particular drawing board jobs. That, that's one kind of thing. And there's another kind of thing where it seems to me that academics have to instill patience in their activist colleagues to allow the academic processes to take the time that they take. And they take a lot of time because you're trying to get it right. Just as it's wrong to want to win, it's also wrong to say, hurry, 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 I need the result quickly. People are starving. Uh, because if you hurry, people will starve even more. <laughs> they will not starve less. Because you'll get it wrong. Uh, Tapan Rai Choudhury was a young man in Bengal in 1943. Uh, Tapan saw some people, the spectacular people that everybody's written about, sitting on the streets of Calcutta and starving to death. He rushed somewhere, got some food, went up to a starving person, gave it to the person. The person died at once. It was a bad idea to feed the person like that. He didn't know. He was this impatient young man who wanted to help. He killed the person he was trying to help. It may be a bad idea to hurry. <laughs> He's written about this now. Imagine what it's like if you're Tapan. If you try to, you know, save somebody and kill them. It actually happened to him. I mean, he, he's a humorist and he turns it into a joke. But it wasn't a joke. He was in anguish that day. Right. Anyway, 
time up, I suppose, or other questions, okay. Oh, thanks then. Yeah.